Ahora, a continuación vamos a dar paso a la siguiente ponencia, que será impartida, como veis, por el profesor Daniel Pitti. Eh, si me permitís primero unas palabras en inglés muy cortitas para agradecerle su presencia y después ya paso a presentarle en, en español. First of all, it's a pleasure and a great honor, Daniel, to introduce to our archival community this day. Only I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of Serena Hernández and me and um, for attendance uh, to this meeting and for listening to me in Mexico and unknown Spanish archivist. And thank you very much for that. Uh, now I'm continuing um, uh, your introduction in Spanish, uh, if you don't mind. Eh, Daniel Pitti es el director del proyecto colaborativo, colaborativo conocido como Social Network and Archive Context, el conocido proyecto SNAC para nosotros, de la Universidad de Virginia. De igual modo, Daniel Pitti es el presidente del grupo de expertos sobre descripción archivística del Consejo Internacional de Archivos, en el cual está encargado de desarrollar eh, un modelo de conceptual de descripción de archivos llamado Record in Context, el RIC. Entre 1993 y 2010, Daniel Pitti fue el coordinador principal de la arquitectura técnica del Standard Encoder Archival Description, EAD, y entre 1997 y 2017, Daniel Pitti fue director asociado del, Institu del Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities de la Universidad de Virginia. En esta primera parte, antes de, 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 del descanso que vamos a hacer, eh, Daniel nos va, se va a centrar a hablarnos sobre el RIC, sobre el Record in Context. Eh, el cual, como habéis visto, eh, eh, según nos ha, nos ha contado Javier, ha estado muy influenciado por nuestra norma, por el modelo conceptual de la NERA. Y sin más, dejo a Daniel que continúe. When you're ready. Thank you. Um, it, it is, um, it's a supreme honor and pleasure to be in Spain. and the opportunity and it's a, a wonderful time for me to, to make contact and see my friends in Spain with whom I've been working and also the opportunity to meet many of you in fact so many of you this morning that the names sort of flashed by qu quickly um, I'm going to speak about the International Council on uh, Archives Expert Group on Archival Description uh, Standards effort that is very much related to what you, you, you just uh, heard from Javier. And uh, something that I would like to say uh, is, is that there was a certain amount of, of uh, hu humility, I think, in, in Javier's presentation in that uh, he talked about uh, you know, the collaboration with international standards and, and wanting to, to uh, uh, in time, adapt, uh, adjust to, to keep them in alignment. But, but the, the, the humble part of that was that, it, in fact, the work that's been done in Spain has had a profound uh, impact on the work that we're doing I internationally. We have, uh, al along the way, frequently paused and stopped to look at NADA, uh, or I, I turn and say, Javier, how are you doing this, or how are, have you addressed this problem? And so I, I should say, you know, uh, up front, I think the international community, uh, uh, on their behalf, I'll express gratitude to Spain for the hard work that's been done. Now, uh, uh, what I intend to go over here, and I'll, I'll try to go over it as quickly as possible, unlike Javier and, and others, I have no affinity for drawing diagrams. So everything you'll see will be strictly text. And if, if we need diagrams, I'll probably just gesture like this. Um, So I'm going to provide some background on the work of the experts group and um, 
and then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, ICA standards, um, some context for all of that, and, and then a very quick overview of just the top level entities. So in terms of, of what uh, Javier was talking about with NADA, I'm not going to cover the attributes or the characteristics. Um, or, or the relations, I'm going to stick strictly to just the high-level components of it, mostly because it's, you know, it's a matter of, of, of time. So the, the experts group on archival description was formed in 2012, um, and uh, it was late in 2012 when I was asked to chair it, and it, it took us a while to get going. Um, so r really, in many respects, it's two th well into 2013 when we finally got down to work. It's the partial successor to the Committee on Best Practices and Standards, which in turn had a fairly long history itself. Um, but but it's essentially the best Committee on Best Practices and Standards was the group that produced the four ICA standards that currently exist. Uh, the expert group in archival description, or e EGAD, um, f finished its first term in 2016, and we're in the midst of a second term, which will end in 2020. And our charge is develop a conceptual model for archival description based on the four current ICA standards and employing formal information modeling techniques. Um, the International Council on Archives, and, and in many respects this is, is, is probably the beginning of, of archival standards, certainly in an international sense, um, by the archival community at all. It really began in the late 1980s, and it was prompted by archivists in Canada. And, and this resulted uh, in, in the issuing of principles in 1992. Uh, and the first standard that they developed was International Standard Archival Description, or I said G. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the basics of, of, of what it was, but not, not a great deal of detail. The second, and that was 1994. In 1996, ICA released the International Standard Archival Authorities records, and then both of those were re revived. I said first in, in the late 1990s. Um, and uh, ISAR in the early 2000s. And then along came two additional standards, International Standard Description of Functions and, <coughs> excuse me, International Description of Institutions with Archival Holdings. Now, I'll go back to the, them in a, in a few moments. So when, when the e EGAD met for the first time, um, I, I insisted that we, we go back to first principles and reconsider first principles of archival description, which made a lot of people uncomfortable because usually when you talk about first principles, particularly in an international co context, you immediately get arguments and contention and there are linguistic cultural differences. But actually, the discussion went quite well, and it was you had somewhat competing uh, expressions of what the principles were, but for the most part, we all agreed on, on what they, they were. And so the most fundamental principle of all is the principle of, of provenance, so the respect to form. So the records accumulated by a person or group in the course of life and work are to be kept together and not intermixed with the records from others.
and then respect for the original order, which is to say that the intellectual grouping and arrangement of those records within the forms have an internal logic and interrelation with one another that, that provides the, the, uh, an immediate context within that relates them to form the whole of, of the folds. Now, um, so we have general agreement on this principle and these two facets of the principle. And while admitting that there are historical and cultural differences in understandings, that, that basic statement of the principle is pretty much agreed upon internationally. What we decided to do was was to, to sort of abstract this and elevate it a bit, uh, paying uh, uh, honoring the principle, but thinking of it in a, in a little broader way, is that what we were going to do is describe records, and we started off with context in the singular, and then decided, but n no records have an existence and exists over time and the context becomes context in which they exist. So that was going to be the fundamental uh, basis of, of, of what we were going to address in the descriptive standards. So we felt that it embodied both facets but that it allowed us to incorporate a, a much more expansive understanding of what provenance means, because the traditional understanding of the phones, the one agent, uh, is, is a simplification of reality, that in reality, the world is far more complicated than that, that the records one will find in one accumulation, in fact, participate you know, they come from multiple sources. They, in not an accidental, but in, in partially accidental way, all, all come together and are become accumulated by one agent. But that one agent's not responsible for creating all of those records. Create some of them. Some of them are created by others. They're merely the records accumulated by the agent in the course of life and work activities. So we wanted to, to, to be able to accommodate that greater, more expansive understanding of the complexity. Okay. The longer I, I'm involved in, uh, in, in working in an international context, more affinity I have for going back to either Latin or Greek wor words, which frequently work much better in an international context than uh, I English. And in fact, e English presents some major problems, which I'll allude to later. Uh, but I, you know, in the course of various academic disciplines and their view of the world, it suddenly occurred to me, in fact, when I was in Mexico City, uh, that we might think of man as, as uh, homo in scribo, which is a man that inscribes, writes on, records. And that from an archival point of view, that's how we see people. They're, they're record creators, record generators, record accumulators. And that the records and the context within records are created and used is irreducibly complex. We can describe them, we can design complex systems which we try to present in a simplified fashion and attempt to capture the, the complexity, but in the end we can't capture all of it. So that isn't the objective. But we do want to be as expressive as possible in our description and representation of records that we can capture 
the, the most important aspects of the, the essence of, of the context and, and to describe the, the records adequately in order to be able to preserve them and to preserve the context. So preservation, which came up very much in the very first presentation this morning, you know, is, is a fundamental here. And though description isn't all of preservation, it's an essential aspect of preservation. We typically think of, of, of description quite frequently in terms of access, and facilitating accesses, access. And it is indeed that, but also in a more fundamental sense, our intellectual, you know, in looking at processing records that are in our care, trying to understand them the context, uh, where they came from, how they were created, what they were used for, is that context is not inherent in the records themselves. It needs to be provided by, by the, the records managers in the first instance and by archivists subsequently. I'm going way too slow. I have a tendency to be verbose, for which I apologize. So ultimately, the preservation of context, the, just think of a record traveling through time and finds itself in different company along the way, and yet being preserved in, in the company it was found in uh, as well. So our, our ability to preserve that will never be perfect, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, it's, it's just we need to be able to make it as, 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 as good as we can afford to make it in order to enable users to understand and use the records today and into the future. So. If I haven't said it enough, context is complex. And as Javier's diagrams would show you, indeed it is when you attempt to describe it. Even if you can't describe it entirely, even describing it partially, it's still pretty complex. So what we aspire to do with the conceptual model is to improve our capacity to represent the complexity of the origin and history of records. We want to isolate what are the essential things that are of concern and interest to archivists and to records managers to model each of these objects of interest and then the characteristics of each, the attributes, and the relations among them. And if this sounds like NADA, it's because they're both conceptual models. And it's not model the world in its entirety. It's just model the world from the perspective of records managers and And so the model is going to inevitably be complex, but I, I think um, you know it's possible to implement complex models uh, inside of a computer where that complexity in many ways can be masked by the interfaces that are provided that, that, that present it all in ways that are a little more congenial and and comfortable, so that processing and describing should be uh, a form of torture. It should actually be a pleasant experience. So relax. Okay. So at least you know, since at least the the 19th century, uh, the cultural heritage communities um, have been coming up with 
ways of describing and standards and methods of describing. And over the course of the last, uh, you know, 150 or so years, more, 160, 70 years, uh, communications technologies have, have radically changed our ability to, say, process and describe and capture that description on some medium has radically changed. What we can do is, is you know, breathtakingly more than could be done in the 19th century or in the middle of the 20th century, or, or even uh, you know, past the middle uh, of the century. And one of the key things here is as the communication and, 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 and media technologies have changed, the trend has been within the cultural heritage communities where they might have originally had a single apparatus. So in the library world, you had the, a book catalog. And then suddenly along came these techniques of stereotyping and, and the invention of cards and card catalogs. And that, that book catalog went away and suddenly you had the card catalog, which let them do things they couldn't do before. And so on and so forth, down into to the mark format and other things within the, you know, the library community. Archival community, a bit lagging behind all of that. But um, following very much the same kind of trend, which was to separate the components of the description and describe them separately, and then to interrelate them. See, here's my diagramming. To describe them separately, interrelate them. And by doing so, uh, to enable creating new tools, new perspectives, new paths, and based on recombining these components. So the four ICA standards reflect this trend, though I would argue that the separation in the new perspectives was, was never really realized with them. So what are the current and emerging technologies? So there's the network, uh, of course, the internet. There are markup technologies, or for those of you who have been initiated, the markup technologies. Some of you know what I'm referring to with this. And then there are database technologies, SQL. It so happens that that SGML, the predecessor to, to, to uh, XML, and SQL were both codified in the same year by the International Standards Organization uh, in 1989, I believe. It might have been 88-89. And the two technologies have dominated. But there's been the emergence of, a, of another technology in the late 1990s, graph technologies. And if you're familiar with this at all, you would be familiar with, with things like uh, RDF. You hear people talk about triples, uh, semantic technologies, and linked open data. And the thing about graph technologies as a form of rep representation is, is they're more complex than, than, than uh, SQL and, and XML. They're more flexible. And the ability to represent 
the the world when you can become more expressive in that representation of it, then you can do a better job of that re representation. But the flip side of that is 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 it's more while it's more expressive, it's also it's certainly at this point in the development more complicated, and, and there are issues surrounding a higher demand for the quality and consistency of the data in order to make it all work. So with, with opportunity comes a certain challenge and burden as well. Okay. Now, it's within that context that we're developing the records and context or, or RIC, and there are three, uh, three products records and context. There's the conceptual model. And, and this will resemble in, in some ways what, what is, you've seen in, in NADA. Uh, so it, it's along a traditional kind of, of written documentation with diagrams and examples. And it, it would come closest to if you're trying to intellectually transition from the ICA standards to to rig, it, it should help bridge that, you know, be the place to start to intellectually figure out what's going on. The second product that we're working on is an ontology, and this formally moves us into the graph arena, and this will be expressed in a World Wide Web Consortium language, OWL language. Um, that formally, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a very formal representation of, of a conceptual model. And what we want to do with that is that, you, you know, for some of you, you uh, no doubt know that there's a, an immense amount of pressure um, and I've seen this in the European context with, say, Europeana, um, the, that archives participate in, uh, in the semantic web and that they participate with libraries and museums in particular on the semantic web. And, of course, that's all well and good except for the fact that archives are not libraries, archives are not museums. Archives do not describe the same way as libraries. They do not describe the same way as museums. And yet, there's an intent, immense amount of pressure to try to get archivists to act like librarians, which, as archivists, we find it a bit offensive, don't we? And so, in part, what we're after is, is we want to make sure that the archival community is able to describe and take advantage of the new technologies using its own vocabulary determined by the, the archival community and that serves their obligations and their professional principles. And then finally, the third product we will have is application guidelines, which will try to make sense out of the other two things that we, and try to help people to say, how, how will you apply these? And to give a, a variety of different implementation scenarios. So the, the predominant form of archival description uh, t today is, is m most of them based on ISAD-G in, in one fashion or another. And it's hierarchical top-down description of a single phones. It's description of the whole and then parts of the whole, parts of the parts. So my lack of diagrams, here's my tree. It's a tree structure. 
and uh, it's largely, if not exclusively, if you describe a poem, is it's self-contained and inward-looking, as though the records in a phone have nothing to do with anything else in the world, that they only exist within this hierarchical tree, interrelated to themselves, which is not true. So it's not connected to the broader context. And so everything contained in one thing. So I said, G, a model for this approach. EAD, a method for communicating it. So in Rick, one of the pivotal changes is to go we're not going to get rid of the hierarchy. Hierarchies are good. I have nothing against hierarchies. They're great. In fact, I like lists. You know, lists are good. <laughs> hierarchies are good. But we have the ability to take the things in that hierarchy and interconnect them out to things in other hierarchies and to connect the hierarchies with one another. So that what we envision is archival description is a vast social document network. That the archives in Spain, the records in Spain that are held in the different are in fact all related to one another and from one archive to another. And not only that, but all of the records in Spain are interconnected to records in France and in Portugal and the United States. And you know, they you know, people are fond of saying we live in a global world. We've lived in a global world for a long, long time. And our records are, in fact, uh, all intertwined and interconnected in some fashion. So Spain, you know, in the same sense of phones doesn't exist in isolation, Spain doesn't exist in isolation, nor does any archive exist in isolation. We all exist in a context, and that context is a world full of people making records Sorry, I get carried away. And then another pivotal change within RIC is we're not treating individual records and in, in aggregations of records as, uh, as, as a single thing, the way I said G does. I said G, in fact, almost doesn't even recognize that there is such a thing as a record, it mostly only recognizes that there are groups of records, aggregations of records. And within RIC, we're making a clear distinction between the record as an individual item and then record sets, so sets of records. And we're making it clear that a record can exist in more than one set at the same time, and that sets can have sets within them, and that sets might be members of more than one set at the same time. And the reason we're making a distinction between the record and the record set is that there's distinctly different kinds of things. They're both record kinds of things, but the provenance of each is not the same. How they came together and you know how a record came to be and how a set came to be is not one and the same thing. There are differences in them. And so we wanted to separate them to make it clear to people when they're describing that they're two distinct things, related but different. 
Okay, so uh, I'll speed it up a little bit. Um, so we released the first draft in September 2016, and we got an enormous amount of, of comments from 62 individuals and groups representing 19 countries. And, and so this, this was a, a, a great response. And, but when compiled, it was over 200 pages of comments. And it's, you know, when you're working with a part-time group of people working on a standard, going through, through 200 pages and trying to be thoughtful in going through all of them is a bit of a challenge. Um, in addition to the fact that sometimes the comments are contradictory, one group says, oh, the separation of records and records set is great. Another group says, that's a terrible thing to do. Why did you do that? As you can see, we sided with the group that liked us versus the one that didn't. So we met in Rome in late this year, and now we're working on the second draft. Uh, we were actually hoping to have it out by now, but as always, these things tend to take a, a lot longer than we expect. Um, but we are, you know, say mid mid year, hoping to have the second draft out, and we're meeting in Paris in two or three weeks um, to help expedite the process. Uh, we have an incomplete beta draft of the ontology, which we hope uh, early in 2018. And then the application guidelines, we really haven't thought very much about them because it, we really need to get the other work done first. But the objective is still to have all three of the products completed by the end of 2020. Um, so very quickly, to go through, through uh, the, the, the top level entities, one of the, the problems we had in the first draft is we had a list of, I think, you know, 12, 13 entities, and we didn't distinguish them or pr make a priority out of them in any way. Just a flat list. So, you know, I like lists, but sometimes lists are not good. So we, we're now we've gone towards a hierarchy of presentation. And so, we have at the top three primary uh, entities: the record object, agent, and and activity. And if I had more time, I would go into why activities there instead of function. But for lack of time, if you want to know why, you'll have to ask me during the break. The record object, here comes the hierarchy, is there's a record and a record part, and then the record set. So record set could be a phone. A series could be a file, and then person is is the, as or agent has four uh, kinds of agents: uh, the individual person, and then a group, and the group is subdivided into two possibilities: family or corporate body. That this would ultimately be ex extensible because there are other kinds of groups that. We, we may want to address within an archive. And then position um, it, it does something that's a little different. Is position is, if, if defined at all, has traditionally been considered a corporate body, sort of, you know, the pope or the prime minister or the president is treated as, as, as a corporate entity. And instead, we're treating this as a distinct entity. And, and it can cover more than just um, you know, the, the high level le leaders of a corporate entity. I'm wagering that everyone in the room holds a position in a corporate body, which is to say, position you occupy is where you intersect as a person with the corporate body within which you exist. 
and then finally delegate agent, and these would be things like space probes and underwater probes and software agents that function on behalf of their creator. Okay, and then finally we get to the third one. Uh, <coughs> normally, um, in, in, in a good portion of the standards out there, you, what you'll find at the top of this is, is the word function, um, or they'll say bi business activity or business function. B business is a, is a strictly an English word. It's not derived from Latin. And in fact, its etymology is, 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 means busyness which in its earliest usage is it meant being nervous. So how did it come to have such an important role? I don't know. But it presents problems for Romance languages and other languages for translating. And so we had a, a fair amount of discussion here. And what we seem to have settled on with a fair amount of, of uh, consensus is that the third category is we've got people, we've got agents, we've got records, and we've got people doing things. They're active. And those are the three things that, that we're concerned with. And the thing about human activity is that it's rational activity. It's, we do it because for some objective, for some end. And that's where function comes in. So, so why are we doing this? And then process, which is a series of coordinated actions. It's the, the activities, the things we're doing, is how we accomplish that objective. And then we can break that down into individual actions. And then we have some secondary entities that are used for describing those primary en entities. And these are treated, you know, in, in, in some models they be treated as attributes. In a certain sense, what we're thinking of them as is complex attributes. The things that we want to attach to and say about other entities, but they're complex enough in themselves that we want to control and manage them and say things about them. And so of these appellations, names, titles, terms, uh, identifiers, persistent identifiers, terms used within your archive for controlling and identifying things, and then uh, classification of entities. So occupation is a way of classifying individual persons with respect to a, a profession, trade, uh, uh, field of activity, etc. cetera. Um, well, this should be the word, uh, I forgot to substitute the word activity there. That should be the word activity and then under it function or process. Uh, documentary form and then record class. And we're still having a lot of intense debate about exactly how to manage these. Date and place are particularly important entities that are used both in describing, in, you know, in describing individual of the primary, secondary entity, but also relations about them. So, and then finally, uh, we have an overarching category, which is concept or thing which in a certain sense embraces everything that I just described before. But we're treating all the things I described before as a particular interest to us as artists, as record managers. And then everything else in the world is under concept, you think. So if it's a book, it's a thing for libraries to do. And we're not going to tell you how to describe it libraries do it. If it's an art object, if it's a building, whatever it is in the world, 
it falls outside of what we're primarily interested in, it's in that group of things. And you may have need to be able to refer to one of those things, but we're not going to tell you how to describe it. And I think this is the end of it, is, is that um, we're going to have both relations. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that when, when two entities, two things come into relation with them, um, I'll use marriage as this one. Thank you very much.